Lauren is like, she did too much. Turn the mic off. <laughs> Lauren's like, no, I love her. Wasn't the panel great? Give it up for the panel. Thank you, Lolly, for moderating. All right. I know what y'all really came up in this thing for. Y'all not waiting for lunch. Y'all waiting for Joy Ann Reed and Stacey Abrams, honey. And I see them right off the side. So please, please, please stand to your feet. It is my pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague, the, the, the baddest black, one of the baddest black ladies in prime time. MSNBC's Joanne Reed. And she will bring out the incomparable Stacey Abrams. Give another round of applause for Miss Simone. Simone got up there. She said, get comfortable. Are y'all comfortable? Are you comfortable? She said, get comfortable. Women, I'm comfortable. Woo, she done enlivened my spirit. I am ready for this. Okay, everybody, let me now welcome to this stage the incomparable, the woman who I believe is one of the greatest forces for democracy that we've seen in the modern era who registered more black voters and encouraged voter registration in a state people thought could never, ever, ever vote majority for a Democrat, and now has elected not just the first, its first black United States Senator, but its first Jewish United States Senator at the same time in the same election, in large part due to the effort that this lady put in place. She is an author, she is a re recovering politician. <laughs> and we love that she was in politics because she made Georgia better. She is the author of not just uh, books for adults, but books for children, the great Stacey Abrams. Bring her on stage. Give her a round of applause. Thank you. Sit yourself down, my sister. Yes, ma'am. Ooh, Hello. Sister Simone said, get comfortable. Let's get comfortable. We're going to get comfortable because we're just going to chat. And this is a fireside chat, meaning that Sister Stacey and I, we're just going to chat and like we're just alone in the room. But we know our friends are in the room, too. And we're going to give you guys some time to ask questions, too. Um, but I want to start by you are a, a multi-talented author. Your latest book is called Rogue Justice. Appropriate. <laughs> Given that yesterday uh, at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, which might have one or two rogue justices who love a good vacay with some rich friends, <laughs> might love a little insurrection, declined to, to put a halt to a law that essentially makes it impossible to protest in three of the blackest states in the United States, Texas, Louisiana, um, Texas, Louisiana, and I, now I'm going to forget what the third state was. It was in this case. Um, but essentially, and South Carolina. And this was the McKesson case, McKesson versus Doe. And they declined to stop that. Then they took a second case in which they appear to be open to the idea that January 6th insurrectionists should not be able to be charged with obstructing an official proceeding by busting into the Capitol and stopping the uh, certification of the vote. That's a dichotomy that I found interesting, and I want to know what what uh, what you think. So, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I, I do want to put a little bit of a twist on the McKesson case. So, one of the reasons they denied cert in McKesson and sent it back to the lower court was that there was another case that they decided that actually did create more of a protection for protest. Now, the problem is, instead of saying that in the denial of cert, they essentially said Fifth Circuit which likes to strip people of their rights, please do the right thing this time. Because there is now precedent that they have, that they recently created that says what you did is wrong, you need to fix it. Problem is you have to rely on the Fifth Circuit to read, not between the lines, but actually read. And so <laughs> the hope is that the Fifth Circuit will understand that they've been told not uh and that they will restore the lower court decision that actually exonerated uh, Doreen McKesson, but the challenge is that because of the current composition of the court, the best the justices who knew better could do was deny cert. 
as opposed to using this to create an unassailable law. So I know people are worried, but we don't need to be as worried yet. So as a matter of law, our, our, the justices who know better didn't do wrong. We just, but they operated within the scope of what they can do. That said, I am deeply afraid of what they're going to do about the insurrection. Uh, the attempt to read what was indeed a law that was passed in the wake of Enron and that explicitly referred to documents ignores the second part, which said, and anything else. And we have noticed that this court likes to only read the first part, but not the second part of things. And so my deep concern is that the current composition of this court is making it up as they go along. And that's what should be the most chilling and most concerning to us. Uh, the book I wrote, Rogue Justice, is the story of Avery Keene. If you read While Justice Sleeps, Rogue Justice is the second book. And it's about a Supreme Court clerk who is called upon to basically rescue America from a corrupt president who is engaged in international intrigue. When I tried to publish it in 2010, I was told that could never happen. <laughs> so it had to wait a decade before I could get it pr printed. Uh, and the current book, Rogue Justice, looks at the FISA court and the fact that we have a secret court that may be you know, running amok and we don't know. Again, nothing that would happen in real life. All of which is to say, Joy, I think the challenge we have is that we cannot rely on the court as an arbiter of justice anymore. It is the hope that we have. It is the intent that it has. It is not the reality that we live. And therefore, the decisions that we make should always exist within the four corners of the Constitution, but we have to understand that we do not live in the halcyon days when judicial intervention in favor of constitutional rights was a given. We now live in a time when they are making it up as they go along and they are not making it up for our good. Right, and, and I will note that the third state, and I don't know why my brain did not allow this because I should have known this, the third state is Mississippi. And so we're talking about three states which have the highest, numerically the highest black populations in the country, and in the case of Mississippi and Louisiana, two of the highest percentages, in which a case, and as you said, we don't have to panic about it yet, but if you are not familiar with what happened in the underlying case, DeRay McKesson, the guy with the blue bubble coat, um, they are essentially saying that a police officer at one protest in which someone, not DeRay, threw a rock that hit a police officer, this officer is the John Doe in McKesson versus Doe, that DeRay McKesson can be personally sued for the injuries that officer entails. So think about the country that's being built here, a country in which we cannot sue police officers for killing a family member of ours. They have complete immunity from prosecution. The, the law, the, at this stage of the case, DeRay can be sued for an injury to an unnamed police officer and in theory, if this court case, the current one goes the way we think it's going to go, you can bust into the Capitol and stop the certification of the election of the president of the United States, uh, defecate in the Capitol, injure police officers, and do all of those other things. And that's not considered disrupting an official proceeding. And think about who the people were that busted into the Capitol. These were mainly white, self-declared Christians. I always put an asterisk there. Christian nationalist white people, and the people who were protesting in the DeRay case were protesting for Black Lives Matter, whether they were white or not, were protesting about the killing of black people. When you add that to the fact that the Supreme Court has also said that states cannot enforce Article 3 of the 14th Amendment, which says that you can't be an insurrectionist, but somehow they can enforce the, I believe it's Article 1, that says you can't be foreign born. So Arnold Schwarzenegger can't run for president because he's born in Austria, but Donald Trump being an insurrectionist can. None of it makes sense to your point. I feel like we're sort of living outside the constitution and the law right now. We are living in a moment where the intention is outstripping and outrunning the reality. So their intent is to create the nation they wish they had. The reality is that we have for a while enjoyed certain protections, and those protections are not permanent. And I think that's the clarion call that I'm trying to lift up. We do not have a permanent democracy in this country. Democracy is a construct. It is not illusory, but it is a collective responsibility. And when we, let a, we allow any of it to weaken, 
we hope, we, we, we tend to have this sort of resilience theory that it's going to be there. No, it's not. And it doesn't fall all at once. It is eroded. Empires fall not in a moment. They fall over time, and there are signals. And one of those signals is when those who are ordained to protect you use their power to undermine you, that is a signal that they do not believe you belong here. And so our responsibility as Americans is to not just pay attention to what's happening at the U.S. Supreme Court, is to pay attention to what's happening in those district courts, in those state courts, in those juvenile courts, any place where power is seated over justice. If we are not watching, justice will not be done. And those are the very people who make their way up to the top. But in the process, they are the ones who also erode trust in government, trust in justice, trust in each other. And that's the most dangerous part of what's happening here. It is a construct that relies on our, our joint faith. And that faith is being broken over and over again. And it may have these set pieces like the insurrection issues. It may have the set piece of DeRay McKesson being sued because he should have known that a protest of the murder of someone would lead to violence, that we are inherently incapable of having protest. There are assumptions being made about who we are and whose we are that are not being made for others. And if we are not paying attention to every layer of government and every level of justice, their intention will become our reality. And I think to add to that, you know, there are laws on the books that uh, are coming back like ghosts from the past, from the 19th century. Um, laws in Arizona where uh, it was legal to marry a 10-year-old, where the person who wrote the total abortion ban was married three times to a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a 15-year-old. Um, and that person then wrote a law that banned complete abortion. That's coming back uh, to, to, to bite the women of Arizona. You've got these similar laws in other states. Um, and in addition to that, you have things like the Comstock Act, which could be used on a national level to ban abortion. It could just come, it doesn't have to be re repassed by Congress. It's already there. Talk about, I mean, there, there's so much that's lurking in the era when, that I think people mean when they say make America great again. I feel like by again, they mean the 19th century because that was the era when there was no income tax, no labor rights, no child labor laws, uh, no right of women to vote, and blacks had no rights. Like it's the perfect era if you are a certain demographic. And so they can literally restore the kind of America they want that does not include the people in this room simply by enacting the things that are on the books. So or enforcing them, I should say. Which is why we should be fighting every single day to defend DEI, okay? Amen. So, so let me tell you why that matters. So DEI is very straightforward. Diversity, it means all people. The E is equity, that means fair access to opportunity. The I is inclusion, that means you have a pathway to the American dream. The challenge is that DEI did not come about in some Ivy League laboratory a decade ago. It is not a boring seminar you have to go to on a Thursday because somebody said something wrong in the Slack channel. DEI describes 248 years of struggle. And you know how I know? Because it's from the moment this became a country, DEI has been every movement we have had, whether it's reconstruction, women's rights, civil rights, labor rights, women, Chicano rights, LGBTQIA rights, the disability movement, every movement that has removed barriers to access, that has held this country accountable and demanded the inclusion of our participation in the whole life of this country that allowed us access to the economy, to education, and to elections, the Voting Rights Act, that's all DEI. And so when you hear them say that they want to make America great again or whatever term of art they use, or when they are anti-DEI, they are against all people. They are against fair access to opportunity. They oppose you having a pathway to the American dream. If they are telling you, believe them. We have to recognize the DEI is a 248 year struggle that is working. And that is why they are so insistent on tearing it down. And that gets to your question because they start by delegitimizing it. I was listening to the earlier conversation. Most of us have this instinctive recoil when someone calls us a diversity hire. I don't. Diversity means all people. So you had to see me. Somebody removed the barriers to make you see me. That is a good thing. And so we have to not let them steal our language and change our name. 
If somebody called me out of my name, I don't go to my mom and say, I'm gonna change my name legally. No, I'm gonna tell you who I am. And we have decided to allow them to hijack our language and convince us that we're wrong. We did it on CRT. We did it on abortion. They tried to do it on voting rights and I got a little annoyed. <laughs> but we cannot let them delegitimize our language. They have this infernal triangle. They start by delegitimizing our language and making us fight them on Twitter over who gets to say woke. It does not matter. The words don't matter. It, the reason they make us fight is because they know it distracts us. And while they're delegitimizing, they then move on to litigation. They move on to exactly what we're seeing. They are pulling down every federal construct, every law, every rule, every regulation that we have spent 248 years putting in place to remove barriers to access. They are trying to dismantle them because they know once they are down, they have also successfully paralyzed our Congress and taken over the Supreme Court so that we will not have the judicial intervention of the 60s and 70s. We will not have the legal movements that we have seen. We will not have the laws that we need. So when they, when they use litigation to dismantle, they move over to legislation. And they know that if they cannot make us one nation, but 50 states, 60% of whom live in the states that they control, then they can put legislation in place at the state level that makes it impossible for us to come back. That's what they're doing in Arizona. That's what they did in Georgia. That's what they're doing across this country. And it is intentional delegitimize, litigate, legislate. And if you can legislate it at the state level and make sure that gerrymandering ensures we can never get back to the litigation, then they can win. But our response has to be a virtuous cycle. If they've got their infernal triangle, then our virtuous cycle says we have to legitimize our language. Say legitimize. We have to inoculate ourselves by telling each other that we are right. Say inoculate. Inoculate. We have to litigate, not just defending the fearless fund, but fighting those who didn't let us in in the first place. Why are we fighting over 5% and there's 90% of the money waiting out there for us to have access to it? We need to be litigating to get access to the whole pie, and not fighting over a crumb. So we have to legitimate. Say with me. Say. Legitimate. Sorry, legitimize. 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 I, legitimize. You're saying whatever you say. I know. So we just like, wait. <laughs> I, I got all excited. <laughs> Legitimize. Legitimize. Inoculate. Inoculate. Legislate. Legislate. And litigate. And litigate. We have got to do all of the things that they are doing, which means we have to fight in every city council race, every county commission race, every school board race, every state legislative race, every judicial race, because that's where they're making these choices. That's where they are taking us apart. If they can stop us from owning our power, they will get back to where they're going, which is the late 19th century. I grew up in Mississippi. I read about it. I don't want to go back. But we know that we are winning because they wouldn't be fighting so hard if we weren't. And if you want to know even more about it, I'm going to turn the question on my friend here to talk about her extraordinary book that you should be reading, Medgar and Murley. Tell me why that book is important to this moment. Well, you know, and it, it goes to the point that you're making, right? So what Medgar Evers was fighting for was access to the ballot. What people were being killed for in your home state of Mississippi was access to the ballot. And, and I think people need to understand where that fight was taking place in that era, in the early 1960s. It was taking place inside the Democratic Party. And it was taking place inside the primary process. And the way that Democrats were able to manipulate the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment requirements to give black people full citizenship was to say, oh, we're not denying you the right to vote. This is just a private club that you can't be in. And in our private club, you were simply not admitted. But if you couldn't vote, you also couldn't sit on a jury, which meant that it was essentially legal to kill black people. You could lynch anyone you wanted because the jury would be only white men because women weren't allowed on juries until 1968. So what Megar Evers was fighting for was access to the only means of enacting, of, of, uh, of, of having power in this country. The only way we can have power is to vote. And so what he was essentially saying is you have to let us into the Democratic Party primary process. And I feel like what we've lost in this era is what you just said. People have become, particularly in the states where we mostly live, in the southern states, they have kind of given up. And they've said, we're just not even going to bother to vote in these primaries. We're just not even going to bother to vote sometimes even in the general. Or if we vote in the primary and the person we don't want to win the primary doesn't win, we're just gonna walk away in the general. That is the opposite of the way MAGA has taken over the Republican Party. They didn't take over the Republican Party in general elections, they took it over in primaries, where they essentially primaried any Republican who refuses to obey Donald Trump. 
If you don't obey Donald Trump, you get primary. And then they commit to voting for whoever wins the general. Democrats don't act that way. Democrats essentially skip half the primaries. And then when the general comes, they go, well, I don't like that choice. I don't like my choices. You skip the primary. So to go very quickly to the book, Megar Evers literally died for the right to you to vote in a primary. And so the reason I wrote it is that I feel like that, not only is he not well known enough, um, his fight was the hardest fight to have in America. It was in the roughest state. Mississippi had the most successful reconstruction and the most vicious retrenchment against Reconstruction because it had been successful. They were electing Blacks statewide yes. during Reconstruction. So I wrote the book to say, you actually have a roadmap to how to fight this. And this man, backed by this woman, with who, without whom he couldn't have done anything he did, Merle Evers Williams, actually laid us a, a roadmap for how we can retain and exercise power in this country. Absolutely. So I, I would, one piece I would add, in addition to go buy her book, um, and the second thing I would say is make sure you go and buy her book. Uh, and buy Rogue Justice as well. There are two books here on this stage. <laughs> <laughs> but the other piece of it is, it's that we only vote the top of the ticket. That's right. And the danger of the top of the ticket is that all the pain is in the fine print. That's right. I mean, it, it's worse than any Apple Care thing you've ever read. We've got to read the fine print. Georgia, like many Southern states, we only do our judicial elections during primaries because they know that's the time we are the least likely to show up. So the judges who control whether our children go to jail or get help, those decisions are made by fewer than 10% of the voting population. The decisions made about what's going to make it into state law, how much you pay, what, how much you can make, what your children learn, all of those choices are made when they know we're not going to show up. Yeah. I sat in the legislature when they argued to move the judicial elections to the primary, and they were intentional because they knew no, the people who were most concerned about the outcome would be the least likely right. to participate in the decision. We see voting as magic. Like we do it and things are supposed to get back. No, voting is medicine. And medicine has to be taken again and again. And sometimes it's more bitter than whatever you are dealing with. Sometimes it hurts more. But we know, number one, if we stop taking whatever we've got is coming back and it's bringing friends. Yep. Number two, it takes some time. But number three, that the benefit is that if we are willing to take the medicine over and over again, sometimes it's bitter, sometimes it, it's caustic and it doesn't feel right. And I'd rather take the cherry flavored. But sometimes you don't get the cherry flavor. You get the one that tastes like licorice and you're going to like it. Because the, uh, the alternative is that it's going to metastasize and it's going to believe that it has the right to come back and take even more from you. We are in the moment where they are taking more and that means we have to be more than they expect us to be. And be patient the way they're patient. The, the, you know, I was, was saying to Stacey backstage that the only thing that surprised me about the end of Roe v. Wade was that people were surprised because the right has been vowing since I was in high school. I don't want to age myself, but I was in high school in the 80s. You, you, see, you know what I mean? I'm not a seasoned citizen, but I'm getting there. I was, I mean, don't let this fashion fair fabulousness fool you. I'm in my 50s. <laughs> Fashion Fair did hook us both up. Yeah, we look did. fabulous. I'm just not even going to lie about it. I feel good about myself. I'm owning it. Thank you, Fashion Fair. Um, but I mean, they've been vowing since I was in high school to reverse Roe v. Wade. It's just that the Democrats didn't believe them. And just to go right back again to Mississippi, at that time that Blacks were fighting to vote in the state of Mississippi, the president was a Democrat. But the problem is, so was the mayor of Jackson but he was a segregationist. The governor was a Democrat, but he was a segregationist. Everyone who sat on the school board were segregationists. So the problem is the primaries and those lower tier elections, you could vote for Kennedy every day, of the week. it didn't matter because what mattered was who ran your state. And so the thing that I, and this is the way we met actually, was because this sister was fighting behind the scenes in 2014 when we met on the Melissa Harris Perry show in the green room. And I became fascinated with this sister, made her give me her real cell number. <laughs> there, no, they sometimes don't give you their real number, people won't give it to you. But he, I made her give it to you because this is, my, this is my obsession. 
And it's voting, as you said, in the medicinal elections. School board, how do you think they're taking these books? Yes. School board, we don't vote. Well, state legislatures, they determine your right to vote. They determine your right to control your body. Your right to your, that's the state legislature. So I'm, I'm gonna, because I know we're gonna, gonna take questions. the questions. Yes. So the thing to remember is that when I talk about that infernal triangle, the reason they are using the states, Dobbs was a DEI decision. There are three ways to the American dream. Education, what you know. Economics, how you make a living. And elections, who's in charge. How do you stop women from having the power that we have amassed? You control their bodies. Where do women of color live? Where do black women live? In every state that no longer has abortion. You want to control a woman's ability to make decisions. You control her body. Then you control what she can know. Oh, what is that? Students for fair admissions. You no longer allow them into college. And then some colleges use that as a pretext to take away the scholarships that were paying for you to be there because it's the very little money that you are able to access. And then they, oh yeah, gutted the Voting Rights Act so you don't have the ability to participate in elections. This is not new and it should not be news, but the attack on DEI is not an attack on a mayor. It's not an attack on a name. It is an attack on an entire organizational structure that said that we get to be here too. And if we do not understand and start championing DEI, not apologizing for it, not shirking from it, but holding it centered to who we are and using yeah. our right to vote to defend it, because they're coming after DEI no matter where you live, no matter what you want, they are going to come after it because those who are anti-DEI do not want these barriers to be gone. They want to build them back. You think they want a wall on the border? They want those barriers to go up everywhere because we are winning and we need to stay on the job. Tell a white woman, friend, because they are also on the menu. Let's go ahead and, uh, oh no, trust me. This is in part about them. It's not just about the women in this room. This is about them. White women benefit more from affirmative action than any other group and benefit more from DEI than every other group. Embrace DEI. I claim DEI. I proclaim it just like proclaim affirmative action. Yes, I am affirmative action in DEI. Any problem with that? Sorry if you do. Get over it and cope better. Who, who has a question? Please stand and they will bring you a microphone. Where, where are we at? Aha. The young lady in the back stand. with the red. Stand in the red. Yes, yep. yes. You stand up so they can The one who looks a like a contestant on The Price is Right. Yes. yes. <laughs> a <Fire>. new car. <laughs> I'm just so overwhelmed. You guys are so amazing. I feel like I'm going to cry. But um, my name is Siobhan Carroll. I work at the Marshall Project. But my question is about black women. I mean, we vote outsized amounts. And I am just heartbroken about the past elections and I just feel like you should be the governor of Georgia. I'm really sorry I'm getting so emotional. She should be. <laughs> but but how do we how do we work and mobilize and tell a white women friend and like how do we get more people to participate on these lower level elections so that it can change cuz I live in North Carolina and I do feel like I'm a bit paralyzed cuz we have a super majority cuz some Democrats want to switch Repo Republican parties. It's a whole thing. But anyway, but like how do we how do we work at the system level and the grassroots level? And this is also my personal opinion, not on behalf of the Marshall Project. This is just me. Yes, it's okay. we get it. <laughs> Number one, we can't vote alone. We, we pride ourselves on voting, but we do not make ourselves take everybody else with us. Sometimes we do, but we often vote alone. We find the time in our calendar where we can go and get it done and we do it. And then we wear our proud little sticker, ooh, I voted. Do we ask people where their stickers are? That's number one. Number two, we have to connect the dots. This is a room of incredible privilege. You know how to find information. You found out how to be here. You know who's in charge of things. And if you don't know, you know how to find it. For many people who do not vote, it is not apathy. It is despair. They are assailed with problems they cannot answer, and no one will tell them who's responsible. And so then it's a pox on all your houses. So we have to stop with, it's not just reg registration. That's giving someone the keys to a car. You got to teach them how to drive and you got to tell them where the car is and you need to make sure they have a map. And so we have to do the voter connection, meaning we've got to go to those community meetings where it's not really my community, but I possess information that might be useful. And I'm not there to lecture you. I'm there to say, how can I help? We have to use voting as a tool, not an end in of itself. I believe in voting, but not because I think that this is just this amazing theory. I believe in voting because I grew up black in Mississippi and I know that I need people to do stuff. 
And we have to, but I needed to know who was responsible. We have the ability to share that information, but the first question we ask is not why don't you vote, it's how can I help? What do you need? What is worrying you? When people believe that you actually mean it and when you can show them who can help them, they are much more likely to vote. That was the entire notion that we used in the state of Georgia over the course of a decade to start building participation. Georgia might be special, but we are not the only ones who can do this work. Yeah. Amen. Voting is not a reward, it's a demand. And when you're voting, you're not rewarding a politician for doing what you said. You're demanding that they do a list of things. And then if they don't do it, you can then replace them in the primary yes. the next time around. Who's got a question? Stand. Oh, we got it right here. Okay, there we go. Hi there, ladies. My name is Andrea Wigfall. I'm from Merck. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you both, um, and thank you, Ms. Abrams, for a lead from the outside. I've heard it multiple times. Uh, I appreciate it. But um, my question for you um, has to do with the voting, and um, someone before mentioned about the voting. Um, so in terms of, and I remember in high school, they told us if you don't vote, you don't count. And I remember seeing Prize on the Eyes where they told the story about the voting and people who died. And I always tell my sons, People died so that we can vote. So how do we get the message? Um, you said about getting the message out, and you said voting on the primary level. What about like say for those who are independents where there are no primaries? Yeah. And do we try to encourage those young ones who are starting to vote to declare a party so that they can vote on the primary level? How should we go about doing that? So, so some states do not allow you to vote in primaries. Some do. So make sure you know which state you're in. I'm in New York state. The other, the next piece though, is that even if you don't get to vote in the primary, you're going to be represented by whoever wins. I believe in staying in the game. And so my strong encouragement is for people to use whatever system allows them to have the loudest voice. That's like being in a room and you're trying to be heard and there's a microphone, but you don't like the color of the microphone. So you're not going to use it. Well, if you need to call for help, you need to use the microphone. And so we need to do it anyway. The other reality is that not every primary is partisan. That's what I was saying about Georgia. Georgia does nonpartisan judicial elections during partisan primaries because they know that primaries usually bring out the smallest number of people who are the most rabid and they get to decide. That's, that's uh, Joy's point that the people who are the most engaged are the ones who make all the decisions, and then we just have to live with the consequences. Voting in primaries means showing up every time there is an election. We might use primary as the language, but if there is an election, you should be there. It is not about whose name is on the ballot. It's about whether you're in the booth. The last thing I'll say is I, I come from a tradition that understands eyes on the prize, understands the death of Medgar Evers. But the fact that someone died for a right does not mean that you feel compelled to use it. People take action because they think something they are currently concerned about is at stake. We cannot lecture people into action. Let me know the last time I worked on y'all when your mama wasn't in the room. People do things because they see a benefit to them or an ability to prevent harm. That's how we have to couch elections. That's how we have to couch voting. Lecture and hectoring does not work engagement in education does. And also connecting. I think what's happened to a lot of young people, I think to your point, is that they've lost the connection between voting and changes in their own lives. There are a lot of young people, or even not so young, who've gotten their student loans, for instance. They've gotten that magical email that says your student loan balance is zero. And they're not connecting that to the fact that they voted. Like that's part of what we can do as people who are engaged, especially if you're on social media or if you have a circle of friends, you need to start telling people, make the connection. You voted. This was promised to you that your student loans would be impacted by it. And then they were. That's what voting got you. Because people will often say, well, what did I get? And that is people, it's transactional for a lot of people. A lot of black folks, I mean, I think it, it, this is not news to any of y'all, are not in love with the Democratic Party. They're not, they're not Democrats because they have some, some adoration for the party. The party used to be the party of the Klan. The only reason it's not is white flight. When blacks finally started voting in the Democratic Party and broke into the closed club, why a lot of white voters just moved out and went in the other party. And they hated the Republican Party. That's the party of Lincoln. They were like, we hate that party in the South. Suddenly, it's the party of the South. 
It's, it's literally all of it's transactional. And so you've got to start for young people, the people you know, or even not so young, make the connection between when you vote and what you get. If you want books not to be banned in your community, vote school board. Because then you can make sure that the books that you want on the shelves are on the shelf. It's got to be connected to a thing that you actually get. Um, do we have, I think we might have time for one more question. Um, this side, okay. Oh, it's not on. My name is Tawan Stout Mitchell. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, where we have a majority of everything. And we are Y'all got a lot of tests. Ooh, y'all being tested. And the we, Lord is testing And we have a progressive uh, electorate. But now when local control was the dominating factor for communities, we live in a state called Tennessee. And local control is taken now by our state. I was so glad you said connect along with Sister Abrams because I'm 71, Sister Abrams. <laughs> we don't believe you. You're 31. Keep no, going. I'm 71. I'm 71. Lies on the pit of hell. Lies. <laughs> but 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 connecting, because now I see the need for us to collaborate with Nashville, Chattanooga, yes. Knoxville, and for other progressives across the state to find out where the weaknesses are in our state to change our state legislature. Yeah, connecting. You guys have one of the lowest turnout rates in the yeah, country. We do. We do. And, and here's the thing. People don't vote because they don't know who's responsible. So again, they think it's everybody. But you also have the capacity, preemption. So if you live in the South, you don't know what to call it. It's called preemption. It's basically any time a progressive city or a moderate city does anything that actually helps people, the state comes in and makes it illegal for everybody. So if you live in the North, you're used to local control. In the South, you don't. St cities can't set their own taxes. Counties can't determine their property tax values without state intervention. And so because of that, that is why state law matters. It is why I preach legislation. We have got to pay attention to the states. They have successfully over the course of 30 years gerrymandered this country so successfully that Congress is going to be ineffective for many, many moons. They have successfully taken judicial intervention off the table by taking the Supreme Court. They are coming to the states because they know that's where they are and they've built systems to protect them. But we are better, we are smarter, we are faster, but we have to believe in our own superpower. This is the beginning of our origin story and we need to use it so we can win. Stacey Abrams, everybody. Thank you, sister. If you're hashtagging this, it's hashtag all in together. Thank you for having us here. Thank you, Fashion Fair, for making us cute. Love y'all. Thank you. Bye.